All right, so we're live here with Ole, who is the author of um, the O'Reilly book about data catalogs. And make sure I didn't mess up the pronunciation of your name or the title of your book. You want to introduce yourself and talk about your book for a second? Yeah, thank you, Noah. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. My my name is uh, Ole, uh, as you said, Ole Olsen Benjur, uh, my full name, and. Um, yeah, I've written a book about uh, data catalogs. So the title is um, The Enterprise Data Catalog. I just also had to <laughs> remember, recall the title. Um, so The Enterprise Data Catalog is a book that, uh, not surprisingly, about a data catalog. It's appearing here in uh, March in uh, Adelaide. Uh, so I just finished writing the book. How 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 is uh, how does it feel to to finish writing a book? Is it a very stressful journey? <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. Uh, this is my first book. Um, I I thought about writing book uh, books uh, prior to having kids. So when I was in my twenties, um, then I got kids and. Uh, just having a normal career, normal work life, and settling down, everything just took a lot of time, right? And so, so now that my kids are older, not not like teenagers, but I had the time to, to think about writing a book, and I was fortunate enough to to get introduced to to um, O'Reilly editor with this idea, and uh, yeah, the book was accepted, and and the rest is history. But, uh, yeah, it's 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 stressful. Yeah, it's it's very very stressful, but. Uh, also in a positive way, right? A lot of people reach out, they want to do stuff, suggest things. Um, so, so I really like that. I uh, just have to manage it because, of course, I also have my, like, this is a spare time activity, right? So, so, so I have to, to watch out. Yeah, that, that's, that's been my experience as well with, with writing is that, you know, it's, on one hand, it's very rewarding because you, you get new people to contact with and you have, you know, this thing that you produce that you can go to a bookstore and then you see your book in there and, you know, it's super exciting. On the flip side, that what I think a lot of people don't realize is how much work goes into writing a book and also the the stress, like it really is. It's, it's uh, tremendously um, stressful because you you have to produce on a schedule and like you said most people that write books have other things going on you know they have a, a job family and it, it, it in some ways at least for me when i finished writing books i i feel like wow man I'm, I'm never doing this again this was like why did i do this like you know like it's, it's it was it was but then you know you, like, like you said there, there's the rewarding aspect of it uh, that 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 does help out. Yeah, and for me, I think the feeling is um, uh, like even more um, intense because it's my first book, right? So I think, of course, each writing each book, I guess, is a little different, but it also follows the same pattern of like idea, suggestion, acceptance, development proofreading and then publishing right and, and I have to say I have found that process really really intense and so uh, just as rewarding now that it is uh, now that it is over and also a little empty right you, you, all those nights in front of the laptop just writing and writing and writing and now now what to do so um, but I yeah I'm, re I'm really uh, I'm really excited about being finished, of course, and the reception of the book is uh, quite magnificent. So, so I'm very happy. Uh, I, I feel quite fortunate about that. So. Great. And, and do you do you want to maybe maybe summarize in terms of the data catalog? Like, you know, why do why should people care about it? Like, what what is the the point? Yeah, for sure. Like, so, so I need to start a little bit with my, a little more on my background, right? I have a, a PhD in, um, in library and information science. And uh, 
So I've from the University of Copenhagen, and I've also taught courses on knowledge organization, so taxonomies, classification structures, uh, tesori, ontologies, stuff like that. Right? And then on the information seeking part, like the mirroring part of it, like once you've organized all your data or your knowledge or whatever it is, how do you search it again? How do you actually find it? All the techniques, all the technologies and so forth. And so that's my theoretical background. That's what I did at, in academia. And then I went uh, into the industry. I will spare you my entire resume, right? But at a, at a certain point in time, I was in front of this technology that was called the data catalog. And, and I was just looking at all these different sales materials explaining me about like column-based data lineage and all kinds of very cool stuff, but I, I just had a very difficult time understanding the technology itself. What, what, what was it really? I mean, and then I just, I had this, like, I slowly realized that this was just this kind of a search engine for, for, for companies, for the company data sitting in the IT landscape. And I, I felt quite strongly that I could write about that in a way that would make sense to a lot of people. So serve as a, as an introduction that is not that has not yet been put forward and um, that will help many people implement and understand and implement the data catalog. Um, so that was why I wrote the book and uh, it's written not completely from a data management perspective. It also contains like library information, scientific literature, and that's yeah, that's a, a slight difference in. in, in in a traditional data management, the database management approach, and, and the information scientific approach. So I think that, that many readers coming from data engineering, data science, and so on, they will also be a little surprised, and and hopefully they can they can use these perspectives and understandings and and better implement their data catalogs. Yeah, that's an interesting um, you know background be, because one of the things that seems to be different about 2023 is that it's very difficult to find people who admit they read, they read books anymore. Yeah. And at least for me, um, not bragging or anything, but I, I grew up reading books and I read yeah. sometimes a book every day for years. And I went to the library. I went to the library every summer. We would go to, you know, like huge collections of books and I would I would as a you know 10 year old I would go in look at the the index cards find the different books different things and I would search in the library for 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 new topics and and to me I think being able to uh, use a library and find my passion for topics or I mean just and even obscure topics like I remember when I was maybe 10 or 11 I was at the public library and there was a whole section on the history of um, African Americans in the United States in terms of, you know, things that they've accomplished. And I just never, there, there was really almost nothing on that subject, right? Like there was, you know, in, in, at least in traditional high school, they would only teach you about American history, the pilgrims, right? And, and you're like, Oh, okay. That's all that was going on. And then I, for the first time, I got to see other kinds of history. I was like, oh, wow, what's this? And, and, and that was only for me going to the library and, and searching extremely high quality indexes made by experts versus in, in, if you look at um, things like, you know, even Google right now or, or search engines, like, are these really uh, high quality indexes of the material that, that we want people to see versus a library, almost everything in a library is useful. Yeah. If you go to the, you know, if you go to the internet, a lot is not useful. And the, the <laughs> business model is very, is, is, you know, like a very different business model. So, so I, I think your background is such an interesting background to, to apply to this. Yeah. Thank you. Noah. Thank you. Yeah. I, I still am a big, big fan of uh, library literature in general I think so I, I yeah so to brag just a little bit like uh, like you I also grew up reading a lot of books and um, 
uh, you know, it gives you some kind of um, like solidity. So quite simply, if you if you if you if you read a lot of books and think a lot, uh, about a lot of things, you're able to contextualize uh, things that are going on around you in another way than if you just like happen to read like the freaking first page in a newspaper or see some ads and some television shows and like that like low TV when you were growing up, right? So yeah, that's uh, that's something different, right? And I the feeling and so there's a there's an entire theory about uh, how you organize uh, well knowledge, but of course physical libraries, but but knowledge ideas and Subsequently, when you break it down into smaller parts, uh, information or data, right? And so the feeling you just described there with the Afro-American history and, and the achievement that people of those origins have, have had, um, like the discovery that you have uh, uh, at the library there, uh, maybe you call, you, un you know this from, from other uh, contexts, but it's, 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 it's really called serendipity, right? feeling that you stumble upon something, you're extremely surprised about the relevance and importance and, and the interest you have in, in a given topic, and you dive into that topic, you, you explore it, right? And that's like the, the wonderful, wonderful um, uh, effects of serendipity uh, in a library. And so specifically now we're talking about, uh, so I, I don't want to get this like, uh, this conversation to get all dark, but but since we're like uh, juxtaposing that with the internet and everything that's going on online, I mean, with the rise of social media, uh, the the opposition to uh, the the opposite of um, of serendipity, kind of, uh, well, it, it it had existed previously, but it it really caught a lot of attention. It's called simplicity. Now, the definition of serendipity is when you find good stuff as a surprise, when you're surprising, you discover good stuff that you don't know. And simplicity is, is the opposite. It's when you find bad, bad stuff you absolutely did not want to know. And, and, and online, there's a lot of simplicity, right? There's a lot of hate. There's a lot of, like, misunderstandings, a lot of undocumented stuff, a lot of rage. And all that is something that we've seen really um, on the rise with modern technologies, uh, at least for the time being. But I, I think that we, that we will adjust in the, in the decades to come. But, uh, Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I have, to, I have to, yeah, you just introduced me to a new word. I did, I didn't know that word, but I, but I love it. I mean, the, I, and I think it, it's interesting because one of the critiques that I have with what's happening with social media is that it is actually an algorithmic problem that is under the control of the companies. So they, they know, what they're doing. It isn't like it's impossible to stop, like you mentioned, you know, how, how do you pronounce it again? It's called a uh, sublimity. Sub sublimity? Sim, uh, Simp? Simpl sublimity. Simplicity. Okay. Well, you basically, it seems like that's actually the, um, I'll have to pronounce, pronounce that a few times <laughs> to, to get, to get yeah, away. Yeah. Yeah. But, but but essentially the recommendation engine in some sense is you know like an, it is an opposite like you mentioned of serendipity it's almost like the the unintentional effects or you know or now whether it was intentional or not <laughs> because it, it increases engagement but but that's the result is basically bad content so people are constantly exposed to bad content it, which is the opposite of a library, literally the opposite. Yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right. And so the interesting thing I think about my background, not me personally, but like the educational background I have is that library information science was a field that was like 
30, 40 years ago, it was basically just librarians getting academic, right? But then something happened to libraries because of because of what technology libraries weren't that important anymore. Like it wasn't the sole source of information. Like you could you could with the rise of the web in the in the early nineteen nineties, we began searching online and became more and more important. Then books got digitized to a higher, higher degree. Uh, and that resulted in in, in physical books and physical libraries becoming even less important, right? And so two things kind of happened with my with my uh, discipline, like my academic discipline. There were some people that just stayed uh, in this realm of like physical libraries, physical books. We've been doing this for centuries. We need to keep on doing that. And there were a lot of people that understood that <laughs> this is not going to go away. We, we have to adapt to it totally new technology uh, landscape we have to but we have a lot to to offer to that landscape and we understand technology uh, taxonomies ontologies to say we understand and define for crying out loud uh, rdf right so we understand the nature of the web let's use that to actually uh, provide structure and guidance for the web and so i think in the, uh, in, in the beginning of, of the web in the 1990s, there was this big movement and, and idea towards like a more enlightenment, even in a, in a, like in a European philosophical um, dimension uh, to the web. Like you wanted to really, even an artistic dimension to that, you wanted to, to bring a lot of ideas, a lot of knowledge and, and a lot of hope into the web. And that, that quite quite fast got commercialized into a structure that was not really aiming at like spreading ideas and uh, knowledge or at least not only but also just like providing a platform for consumerism which is something like i wouldn't oppose that but it's just something less idealistic right yeah, it, it, you know, I think a good example would be, you know, if you left a child that was between 10 to 18 in a library, there's the, the probability of them having some kind of bad outcome as a result of this is almost zero, mm -hmm. right? Like you could, you could expose them to the library you know, essentially infinite times over a 10 year horizon daily and only their life will get better. Yeah, if you infinitely create simula simulations of 10 year olds to 18 year olds with no constraints onto the internet, probably the opposite, right? Like the more unconstrained, the, the worse it is. Yes, yes, I, I got a... I, I can't disagree in that. That's that's pretty horrible to, to put it like that, but it's it's not. I mean, I agree. That's that's just a horrible fact. And uh, you can even like, if you really want to go down that road, there's a lot of there's a lot of um, like interesting things in, in, in uh, within the field of, of, of librarianship back in the days. For example, the freedom of access to information, like the right of, 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 of of actually obtaining information uh, in a free way, we we think of that as in like the technologists, right? Right. So so we think of that as as a technical discipline, like you can discuss a data mesh or data fabric or stuff like that. But but what does it even mean in a societal context? And and for example, like back in the days, um, there was this there was this oath that librarians had to take that they wouldn't. They wouldn't expose the information-seeking behaviors of uh, mm. of the users of the library. So if the police came and asked, "Okay, this citizen, what has this citizen, what kind of books has this pe uh, this person uh, uh, taken home with uh, with him or her?" Then, then it was actually a, an oath that the librarian would not answer the police because we have have the freedom to obtain the information we want. Now, if you want to con compare that with having our entire an entire browser history lot. It's quite a difference, right? I mean, so 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 
understanding access to information is, 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 is purely a technical thing. It's definitely not wrong. We should discuss that. There's, there's also this ethical dimension to it where you actually like think of what does it actually mean to, 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 to have free access to information? What does that actually mean? I mean, is that simply a technical thing? Because it is, if it is, what's the freedom in it? If you left all your data to someone, it's going to, to, to use that for a variety of purposes. Then, then what's the freedom in it? Hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting thing you, br you, you, you bring up. I mean, I think at least the culture of the United States there's been historically books that, you know, people have always flagged, like, you know, a Catcher in the Rye is a perfect one where it's like, oh, you read Catcher in the Rye. They're, they're, uh oh, <laughs> you know, you're, you're on the watch list, you know, you know, and, and, you know, Catcher in the Rye is a classic, you know, it's, it's essentially like a, a very fascinating book that's timeless in, in many ways. Um, and it's a great piece of literature, but, you know, to, to make some kind of uh, classification that someone that read it is needs to be watched, you know, or, you know, books by Karl Marx or, you know, you know, any kind of historical book where, you know, maybe even like bad historical figures, you know, like Stalin, et cetera, mm -hmm. that reading their, reading their works doesn't just because someone wants to read what someone wrote, it doesn't mean they agree with it, right? <laughs> that it, they could be, yeah wanting to understand it so they can make a critique of it or, you know, summarize it. But if, but if you're, you're exposing people's thought process bef before they even get to the conclusion, the, like it, it, that almost gets into like a science fiction movie, you know, like uh, even um, the, the original uh, Twilight Zone. I remember when I was a child, I watched one where I believe the episode was was a kid had too high of an IQ, and and so that he was in trouble because he was you know thinking too much, and there was some kind of bad outcome. I forget what the plot of the movie was, but this this idea that you want to watch what people are thinking, mm -hmm. unfortunately, with the internet, that is that's that's actually one of the unintended consequences. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. I mean, you can you can totally do that. I mean. Yeah, we're getting off topic uh, in relation yeah. to my book, but I, I don't mind at all because I think like this is interesting. I I have this I have this like um, ethical discussion uh, at the end of my book, philosophical discussion, right? because like data catalogs as a search engine will at some point reach those ethical dilemmas that we have uh, today on the web, like being able to trace feelings and um, negative intentions, um, hatred and, and such, uh, through search is something that will, I believe, occur uh, also more in companies going forward with the technologies that, that, uh, that are being introduced, but also so we simply need the same kind of ethical mechanisms that are, of course, they are they are rising now on, on the web. It's not something that is not like it's being addressed. It's being addressed with all the regulations that we are making primarily here in Europe, but the world, the rest of the world seems to to want to do that as well um, now. Um, but yeah, I, I there's a lot of things I could comment on here. First of all, I I have read Catcher in the Rye, but I I I have never like. There was never anyone before you that have said that it's a controversial. I mean, it's a, of course a very artistic uh, book. Uh, it has a lot of literary quality to it. But I just thought that people read it because of its literary quality. I, I didn't know it was a controversial book, actually, uh, in the U.S. at least. But, uh, but appar apparently so. Yeah, I think I think in the, the. I mean, obviously, every country has got a different culture, and America has actually gone through many periods of. Um, uh, of, uh, I guess, kind of like a, a mass hysteria, right? And so there was a period of time where people were very concerned about communism. And so there was the, you know, McCarthyism and, you know, <laughs> that whole period of time. 
And then, you know, there's been other periods where there's been uh, complaints against wars. And, and, and I think it could just be that books, certain, they, they, they just seem to crop up, it, you know, if they, they have mass appeal and they're unique books that someone who's typically not well read wants to ban them. So, I mean, in my opinion, almost that's a great place to start about looking for a great book to read as an adult, I don't know about a child, but as an adult, if a book has been banned, it's like, well, let's consider this. This mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, almost like a like if I if if you want to randomly pick a, a good topic, well, someone was bothered by it, so there must be something useful in this in this book. We, maybe we should read it. I think uh, no, I mean, uh, I want to like it has it has very little close to nothing to do with my book what i want to say now but it's just like i think we're getting bands uh something very interesting an interesting uh, path here and so one of the things that that perhaps is a little different from being european than an, than an american is that um i think we approach uh liberty of expression differently uh, as as like as societies uh, in Europe we have this very very old tradition of uh, having like newspapers very established newspapers they came about like uh, yeah prior to, to the birth of the United States we had our first newspapers and uh, we also had our first publishing houses and so there was a quite control, uh, quite strict uh, control mechanism that was loosened over the, the decades and centuries leading up to 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 the Enlightenment and the second half of um, the 18th uh, century. Now, this is not a history lesson, of course; it's a tech podcast. But what, the reason I'm saying this is because I think that, for example, libraries physical libraries, if you think of that place, why is that a place that is going to educate a child and, and push that child forward, help that child in becoming a civilized adult? It's because everything in there has been curated, not only as a collection, but also as publications. The newspapers that that child would find in that library had editors, and had its own chief every one of those editors would be responsible for, for what was in the newspaper and they would have to appear in front of court of law if something in their newspaper was false and damaging to a person or to the society as a whole and the same goes for the books that were in that library they would have had an editor and that editor would have worked at a publishing house and that publishing house would have had a responsible editor-in-chief and that editor in chief could be put into prison if something that was published in that publishing house was false. Now, that did not come about overnight. That took decades, even centuries to evolve. And it created a system wherein uh, several systems of publication, of disseminating of information, wherein what could be found in those books and papers could be trusted. It was trustworthy information, things that we could actually believe. And so what we're seeing every time a new medium is introduced is that it's unregulated. Technology always, always um, evolves prior to the regulation that controls that technology. That's the nature of technology, of course, and one of human progress. And so the regulations always always try to do that they also always try to regulate uh, too late and that is why every new medium has this i'd say anti-democratic tendency born into it because every time a new medium look what hitler did with radio and what he did with uh, movies right he was a mastermind in using those media because they were completely unregulated and he could manipulate the masses with them I won't make a direct parallel with anyone in the present, but look at who were very, very capable of using like new unregulated uh, media in a not so 
distant past, right? I mean, you can push, you can push, right? I will mention Breitbart News, for example. It's not a newspaper. Breitbart <laughs> News is not a newspaper. And the reason why it's not a newspaper is because it does not have to appear in front of a court of law. It's, it's considered telecommunications, right? So it's not a newspaper. It's not something where you have to appear in front of a court of law. That has changed very, very recently with conspiracy theorists now actually being condemned for the lies that they're spreading, right? But actually, new technology is in this place and it's in vacuum where they can, you can put forward whatever you want. It's a totally unfiltered reality and no one is actually controlling that. And we call that freedom of expression, but it's not. It's freedom of, of writing. You don't have that distinction in English, but it's very, very... So it's, it's, we, you could express it as something like this. It's, it's freedom of printing, of, of actually typing, typing mm -hmm. on, a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a on a laptop or whatever you have. You have the freedom to type whatever you want, but it's not the, the, the freedom of expression. The freedom of expression philosophically is something where you have to accept that whatever you say is something that you should be able to defend in a court of law as something that is not harmful or just a lie. Yeah, that's a, wow, that's a, a great, um, a great, uh, I, I mean, I think I, this is still on the topic of your book because, yeah, I, 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 and, is, and, and the, I think when you, you bring up the unregulated, uncurated uh, media sources, uh, I, I recently read several books about uh, the rise of fascism and in particular, Mussolini as well was an, was actually a uh, old time radio person. So that was you know he was he was in media as well. And so so the, there there was there was you know fascism and new media are are quite friendly. And there's a there's there's actually over a century of uh, or, or yeah I think it's been close to a century of um, of, of time in the saddle so to speak to 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 expose that. And this, I think the curation is such a great point where, you know, if, you know, would, would a response, if you randomly selected a thousand, you know, educated adults globally, you know, what would they, like you, to your point, what would they, even if they weren't trained as a librarian, what would they put into, you know, a curated source of, of a repository of information it would be very little of what we find on the internet, right? Like yeah. mo most people wouldn't, wouldn't want their children to see, you know, newspapers that are basically designed to enrage people and spread, you know, misinformation for profit. Uh, and, th and that I think is such an interesting point of taking the physical library system. And then if you pl apply it to a company as well, where, you know, I think in the early days of, of data engineering, Everybody's oh data engineering it's amazing yay awesome data more data you know and then if you're just throwing garbage around and, and the, nobody in the company has actually curated it and qualified it and you know cat categorized it so that it it's actually you're like look no this is useful information you know and, and here's how you can use it. That's such an that's such an interesting point that I, I have to admit I've never really thought about that concept in terms of you know people's data in a company. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So it's definitely something where I mean I do consider the so the negative one simplicity as something that is as it would be hard to to stumble upon that in a data catalog than on say Facebook. But it's not uh, impossible, right? I mean, people have a strong tendency as to, to, to express negative feelings towards each other if they have the chance through, uh, through, uh, through, through digital media. Um, but there is this, like, I think uh, many, many data catalogs promote this idea of data intelligence. And I actually think that's a quite clever um, clever way of expressing how we should approach data, right? But, but it's something that, I mean, of course, we can think of it as something very mechanical, right? You can just 
trust data, become more efficient and so on. But it's also something where we can put into context what this data is about, if it really is reliable and useful and can actually bring us forward, right? So I think, I think that's actually one of the great uh, elements of a, of a data catalog is that it is, it is a technology component. It is not a silver bullet, but it is a technology component in, 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 in the idea of creating a more data literate and a, and a, and a data intelligent uh, company. So instead of this mess, um, I won't describe it as something that is as negative as, as, as the reality online, right? Going to, going at work is, is something where like the, 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 the negative dimensions of reality landscape is more rooted in, in a, inefficacy and um, like the impossibility of executing and too high costs of, uh, of data. So, so you have to look uh, deeper to find, uh, of course there's politics and manipulation in a data in a, in a, in a company, of course there is. But you have to look a little deeper than, than online, right? But I think the, the data catalog Nevertheless, it's a component that that contributes to um, to a deeper, more meaningful understanding of the data, of the, and 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 hence the the, the present and also the past of uh, of your of your company. Quite frankly, hmm. yeah. And the other thing that is interesting about um, comparing the cruder. Uh, algorithmic only ways of classifying data is that, you know, if it seems like a recommendation engine, if it was an alternative to a data catalog, in some ways could be tragic because it, it depends on really the context of the, the data that's going into the system. Like if the, you know, if you asked um, some people that were, you know, having trouble in school or, you know, maybe needed some guidance about, you know, their life, et cetera. And you collected all those people and you, you had them share the content that they're interested in to other people that would actually not be useful. That would, that would actually not, that would be the opposite of useful, right? <laughs> Inverse, but in, on the flip side, if it's, if you're having uh, experts uh, cat categorize, things in a way so that there's it, it's essentially immutable like there, there's no way to create a bad outcome as a result of the curation which is what i think a library really is it's, it's a, a a way of almost making like a bulletproof mechanism to to share information because of all the things you mentioned that i didn't know about like that you know there's there's you know a uh, uh, an accountability, right? Where, where people are held accountable for what they're, they're putting there. Uh, and you're, you're actually makes me think your, your, your ideas about um, the library science going into data really is, is gets me thinking about even search engines of today. Like, you know, imagine could there be a, a new search engine that, a, that a, you know, a government or a, um, a nonprofit set up that that was curated, I guess essentially like Wikipedia, but maybe even but more of an aggregate, you know, more of a larger form of Wikipedia. I mean, that could really be helpful to people. It could, it could, and it. So, 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 if we just uh, scroll back to to what I said, like in the beginning of the conversation with this this division of the, of the library and information scientific field back in, I guess, back in the late 90s, right? I mean, there were these, these two camps that's the one, one part of, of like the, this, this field, they said, okay, we want to stay with libraries, that's what we do, we maintain libraries. And the other one that was like going into the technology space saying we, we, have, we have to adapt to this new reality. But, we kind of also understand the nostalgic part, right? I mean, the library system that was built, and it was actually primarily built in the US. I mean, the modern library systems, they were invented by, by this movement in the US back in the uh, 
the late 19th uh, century and then uh, going a little into the 20th century as well. And, and the idea was this intense uh, information campaign, or right, educational campaign for everyone in, like everyone in society, that they could go in there and they could just educate themselves. The idea was not to read good books like novels and stuff. I mean, you could, they were accepted later, but the idea was this big information campaign where you wanted to educate, really intensely educate everyone in society for the better of everyone, right? For the better of all. And so that idea, abandoning that because uh, technology was making it uh, irrelevant to some people that had that calling to them, that I can understand that that hurt a lot. I mean, that hurt a lot <laughs> for those people because because uh, that was like, you can still find them online and you can still find those there literally is an oath that you can, you can, you can swear that you, you will not like pass on whatever information searching habits people have and so forth to other authorities. And there are many things like that. They, they still like they're still to be found uh, out there. Um, so, so leaving all that behind because technology made it irrelevant was very, very difficult. But I think, I think that. Yeah, so, so in a longer historical perspective, I think that what will happen in the next decades or so is that is that we will get we will not like I'm not I'm I'm not I'm, I'm not a regulator and I'm I, I don't want to regulate anything for the sake of regulation, but I think that we will at some point reach a state for the open web where where we cannot accept anymore that people that have no expertise or knowledge or just have uh, like evil intentions that they are they are capable of getting big big platforms where they can just spread whatever miss of this information uh, they feel like we, we will we will uh, we will reach a, a level of civilization where that is no longer possible and we are seeing many 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 uh, things uh, that are pointing in that direction right I mean um, we are seeing it with, for example, the, um, uh, the fact that Infowars was taken down. Uh, we are seeing it with the ban of, um, yeah, I'll say his name, Donald Trump from, uh, from Twitter and social media in general. I know he's back, but let's see what the future of Twitter is because that's another thing, right? If you have very very rich people approaching like social media they approach it they approach it as a consumer platform so they they aren't capable of making the distinction between being being a, a, a citizen and being a consumer but something as a social media it's, it's not it's not you can't just be a consumer of ideas you, you have to act as a citizen and have to respect civilization at another level if you wanna if you wanna have a, a meaningful uh, social medium and, and Twitter definitely was part of, of, of that movement of going towards a more civilized uh, uh, way of having a debate and political uh, exchange of views. But but uh, that was that was that was stuffed with uh, with. Uh, with Elon Musk, but uh, I think his ideas were not completely off. But 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 you can't regulate it as something that it's not. It is it is a, a place where you change exchange ideas. Yeah, and, and and that that's a good segue to talk a little bit about how the European um, Union, in particular, really seems to, in many ways, be the leaders and thought leaders. I think in in um, what's happening with data data governance regulation and it, it, it that i think is one of the 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 aspects of american society that's always been so strange to me is that we we don't seem to care about as much you know things that that europe is caring about and you know like data privacy like you can't send the data to some other location and 
and, and personally identifiable information. If it gets leaked, there's severe consequences for it. And so it, in many ways, it, it would be interesting to see if Europe becomes essentially the leaders in uh, coming up with ideas for how could you take the current mess we're in and make it better? Because <laughs> I, I, I don't think the ideas from the United States have, from the, the birth of social media have really panned out, to be, to be honest. No, I, I agree. I mean, um, it makes me think of this joke that's not really funny, but, but anyway, it's, it's this like, three guys walk into a bar and uh, they, they decide to do information technology. And so the Chinese says, I do the hardware. The American says, I do the software. And then the European says, I do the, I do the regulation. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so it's, it's not that funny of a joke, but it's true. It's it's just yeah. So so I will answer your question, but I I think that we as Europeans, I mean, we should we should get better at, at hardware and software. We're, we're not good enough in that. We, we're getting better. We're actually getting quite a lot better uh, these years, at least on the software side. But but we should get even better. But but yeah, I think I think that. Um, there are being um, amendments made to GDPR currently that will further like emphasize uh, its um, its potential, its strength, um, and um, yeah, we definitely haven't seen the last uh, the last parts here. But I think I think several states are catching up nicely uh, with. Uh, California in particular, but, but, but more states also in the US are, are, are catching up with Europe in this regard. I would I wish we could all do hardware, software, and regulations. I think we should collaborate on all those things globally. But I, I, I guess that right now it is Europe that is really, really leading in that respect. Yeah, it, it's interesting because in I, I know there's this um, there's this uh, mentality that Americans are the most entrepreneurial, you know, companies, or you know, but on the flip side, it, you know, you could say, well, but of what, right? Like, what have what have you produced? And if you look at uh, a two two cars, for example, um, so this is maybe a good analogy. Uh, I I actually did own a Mercedes C34 uh, that had autonomous driving, you know, maybe two, three years ago. And it was, it was for what it was sold as, which is you follow, you know, vehicles in front of you. It, it was good. It was, it was very good. And, you know, if you look at uh, German engineering, they, they, the odds of, of there being problems are just so low. You know, especially for a brand like Mercedes, just the, the, the quality is just exceptional. So there's obviously e examples. That's a pretty good example of the regulation, the hardware and the software all, you know, essentially in a package, really, really out competing um, mm -hmm. other cars. And then if you look at some of the things that are going on with Tesla, and I've been invited there, you know, in person, and I've, and I've seen some of the things. I would say the engineers are amazing, like brilliant people. But if you took look at the the, the, the three things we discussed, the hardware, the software, the governance, you know, I think many people, and I would put myself in this category, would say the governance is lacking, right? So in, in the case of uh, autonomous vehicles, you know, one of the, the biggest critiques is, is that uh, the, the pedestrians didn't sign uh, a waiver, right? That the pedestrians on their bike or walking across the streets didn't like sign up for you know, the potential risk of dying, you know, being exposed to autonomous vehicle, right? That, that, that isn't a, you know, a, a form that's been filled out <laughs> everywhere. So, so the, the difference between America and the way they, they do things versus Europe is, and I don't know how, uh, how Mercedes does testing for their autonomous uh, software, but my hunch is it's done in a very controlled environment where in the U.S. there is no controls. Essentially, it's uh, right. I mean, it, it, it literally it, there is by by design. It's a it's a free for all. 
And I think that that could be a situation where there were short-term rewards that people got from following the American model, but it could be that the companies that have um, got benefits from this in, in a short-term way, they may long-term not be around. And, and I, I, I'm, I'm curious about the social media companies in America that have propagated, as you mentioned, like Alex Jones is a perfect example where he was um, essentially uh, spread according to the social dilemma documentary, like more than the combined uh, output of all major newspapers by some, you know, some factor. I don't, I don't know the exact number, but basically he was recommended at, at at least the same level, if not more by these social media companies. And it's like, that's a lack of curation, right? That, and then what is, what are the consequences to the brand uh, of, of, of not having good data catalog, right? Like, like there should have been a data catalog where like, this is not a source that should ever be exposed or recommended in any capacity. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. There really is no, nothing good to say about Alex Jones, but there was, for me at least, quite a lot of joy in watching him uh, not being allowed to tell his lies in front of a judge. I think um, it shouldn't have gone that far, right? Because, but but I guess that's I mean, it's something where like where. It's both very related to my book and very much not related to the book. And it's not, I don't, it's not because I, I want to pr promote my book and that I mention it. It's just like, I don't hope the, the listeners get, get, get too excited and buy my book. And then there's nothing about this topic in, in my book, but it's, it, so it's more of, uh, but because of that, that I mentioned it, but, but I think, I think, uh, I think this entire, uh, at least that the tradition I was trained in, uh, the discipline that I was trained in, really thinking about like the trustworthy sources, how you expose them, how you make them available, how you can search them, what they can do for people, and so on. And and the the, the genre uh, as a catalog that really is the key to uh, to a collection of knowledge, of ideas, of, of things that can educate you and push you forward, right? And so. Those are the methodologies that, that I have understood from various catalogs and that I've put into this book. Uh, so that it's not just, I mean, a lot of the documentation on data catalog is very, very technical, right? But the idea of catalog as something as a gateway or uh, whatever you want to call it to, to a collection of ideas, of knowledge, uh, and ultimately of data, that, is, uh, that is, 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 is something that has a deeper philosophical meaning to it. And that's rooted in. And everything that we've discussed uh, that is going very much on. But I think that, yeah, I think if we should tie it all together, I think that the, the web, the open web, needs a data catalog more than it needs a, a commercial search engine, right? Because hmm. it's very, very, it's very, very, uh, yeah, yeah, to be honest, it's, it's quite dangerous for society not to have, to have it. You can see the first consequences. That. But but I remain an optimist. I think that I think that uh, civilization and good ideas and will uh, will win this as as we have done in the past. Every new medium uh, goes through this uh, stage. That was like the first laws against uh, not being able to publish lies in books. Were actually made in in Denmark in uh, my country. I live in Copenhagen, Denmark, and. Um, and the first lies of like all the first laws uh, stating that you shouldn't be allowed to print lies and, and circulating lies lies on print they were actually made in they were written in Denmark so so every new medium has that uh, the internet as well but we just have to take it has to take some time before people realize that it's simply too dangerous to be able to like freedom of speech is not just whatever yeah and it's interesting that that um you know if you look at some of the um the the mottos of companies american tech companies they'll they'll have these 
these like grand, you know, visions like uh, organizing the world's data that I think is, is one of the, <laughs> one of the, the mottos of Google. And there's a lot that Google has done well, but again, going back to the lack of curation for Alex Jones, that is in organizing the world's information. That's actually, as you mentioned before, the opposite of serendipity. You're, you're creating, you know, uh, a problem that needs to get cleaned up. And, and I, I think it's a very, I mean, just to kind of tie everything together, I think it's, it's such an interesting topic to, to bring up where, you know, I think that a, you know, people in the data space should read your book because I think your philosophical background is a very unique approach to data engineering. And then B, I think it, it opens up many, uh, I think ideas about, you know, how can companies compete in the future? Is it just going to be that you went faster, you know, move fast and break things because there are obvious consequences to moving fast and is there a way to compete where you actually are more holistic about your, your, you're careful about what you're producing so that it's high quality. And then, as you mentioned, C, which is in terms of the search engines is the future of search engines actually curated search engines that have some ability to essentially eliminate uh, the effect of low quality information through a, a data catalog. I think that's what I got out of our conversation. I think it would be amazing if those things happened. Yeah, thank you, Noah. Thank you for this beautiful uh, like, um, uh, conclusion on, on our talk. And uh, yeah, it was really, really, really interesting talking to you. I think uh, think this, is, uh, this has been a very good special conversation and I really enjoyed you asking questions that made us go into directions that were a little different than what I that I normally talk about and just uh, talk more um, closely about the various chapters in my book but this is definitely something that I think is very very important and uh, yeah that, that is in particular the last part of my book has this philosophical and um, uh, futuristic take on what can happen also generally from for the for, for society in, 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 in general um, on these kinds of technologies um, I think search uh, engines and the way we act interact with them exposes the good and the bad inside us and equally so so it's up to us to decide how we want to use this technology um, and I remain an optimist. I, I, I am I'm very, very certain that we will be able to create good technological sustainable solutions that will be with the world in a way so they push our society forward. So just answering your, your questions a little bit, yeah, I, I am 100% optimistic. I think that in a decade or two from now, we may even be able to let our 10 year olds just uh, walk around uh, online, seeing whatever they want, as it's safer, more educational, hmm. and um, better for them. But it, it will take time. It will take a lot of time. And, uh, yeah, and, and uh, one last thought I, I was going to mention to you that you're, you're reminding me of something that I had thought about maybe a year ago was that if if the difference between write, reading a book and reading something online is you can actually mathematically calculate one of the the, 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 the the problems with reading stuff online is that, you know, if you say like, for example, your book, you probably took at least a year to write it, right? So a book takes between one to 10 years to write. And so you're, you're essentially getting, you know, every time you read something, you're multiplying this knowledge that took years to acquire Right, like, you know, or someone took 10 years to write uh, like a classic book or 20 years to write. I don't know how long it took to write uh, Moby Dick. Let's just say 10 years. I don't know. I'm assuming like, you know, and you, and you just say 10 times in, right? And you, and you say like, you know, you, you get this huge number. And then you say, you know, I, someone on BuzzFeed or Breitbart took 30 seconds. 
maybe they use some chat GPT and they put something, one, one number will be much higher in terms of, in terms of the, 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 the years of knowledge it took to, to, to create that. So, and it's basically the equivalent of what you just said, right? With the, uh, the data catalog is, is it's essentially a, a weighted number uh, about the, the quality of a resource, right? Like how, how, how many years and how much quality is associated with it. So it's, it's an interesting, I don't know if you've ever, ever thought about that, the, the, the years it took to write something no, in, in multiple. Not in, that, not in that way. The, my problem has always been a little more simple, right? That, that, that you can't read all the books in the world. Sure. So how, how many books can you actually read in, in, uh, in uh, the course of a lifetime, right? And uh, I haven't thought of it uh, like that. Uh, I, I, I like that better. Yeah, I think it's way better to think of like uh, accu accumulated uh, knowledge uh, in, in that respect. And I uh, totally agree with the fact that like it's it's matured thoughts that have been it has taken a lot of time before it has been published and if it's a scientific paper it has been peer reviewed and if it's a book it has been reviewed by an editor back and forth and yeah that is definitely more trustworthy information. Great. Well well thanks again for, for chatting and I have to admit I'm really excited to read your book now. So I'm gonna I'm gonna probably read it in the next uh, few weeks here and I'll, I'll definitely let you know what I think. Thank you. Thank you, Noah. And uh, for the for the listeners out there, I want to say that the discussion that we've had on this podcast is, is very much linked to the last part of my book. If they are a little impatient to get into that kind of viewing of more philosophical, more uh, intellectual discussion. But I really, really enjoyed this conversation. Uh, uh, and I am eager to know what you think of my book. Sounds good. Okay. Have a, have a great night. I know it's late there. Yeah, no worries. No worries. Okay. Talk to you later. Bye.